Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Innovation Storyteller Show. We are taking a very interesting journey today. Um, how many of you ever really think about the wild world of insurance? It's renewal season for most of you on the health benefits side, and maybe you're checking out dental for a change. That is not what we are talking about today. Absolutely nothing related to your medical insurance. What we are talking about is how do we actually insure and how do we begin to contemplate how innovation gets done? And by the way, let's get even more meta. How do you innovate what the insurance even that goes into insuring the cool new thing, the great new uh, potential that lives within each of our organizations? How do we begin to think about protecting what's coming next? And that's why I'm really excited to have my guest today, which is Mach Millet. Now, if you don't know him, you're going to by the end of the show. We're going to be talking on um, a host of topics. We'll start in a journey maybe in Central America. We will move our way into the wild world of the legal profession, and then we'll dive into all things insurance and what's coming up next. So why does this matter to you? It matters because there are things going on in the background. There are things going on that support the work of innovation that maybe you haven't even contemplated before. This is an exploration of that. So let's dive in. Mach Millet is the Chief Innovation Officer and Alternative Investment Practice Leader at Locked In Financial Services, a role where he creates new insurance products for unaddressed risk exposures, sound familiar, and serves as a technical expert on management and professional liability issues for private equity, venture capital, and hedge fund managers. We're gonna talk about SPACs as well and also private and public companies and the special types of protections that might be needed there. Mach came to Lockton after 12 years at Marsh and 10 years as an attorney at a little mom and pop firm called Skadden Arps, maybe you've heard of it, <laughs> where he practiced law as an intellectual property and securities and general commercial litigator and insurance coverage defense lawyer. He has extensive experience crafting insurance contracts and litigating, arbitrating, mediating, negotiating the settlement of some of the most complex securities, intellectual property, business, and insurance coverage disputes. Now, contrary to that very impressive bio, this is actually going to be a lighthearted romp through the world of insurance and how we actually get here and really think about protecting the things that we're working on, those unforeseen circumstances and the corners and the blind spots that we have to weed out and folks like Machu help us do that. So thank you so much for joining me on the show today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So Machu, you know, the first question I ask everybody who comes on the show is how'd you get here? Because nobody walks in through the front door of innovation. Tell us a little bit about your journey to stepping into this role. Give us the quick overview bio beyond what I just read. Sure. So it was a long and winding road, but I will try to keep it relatively short. <laughs> so I was born in Nicaragua. I was uh, born in a small town in the northern mountains of Nicaragua called Ocotal and lived on a farm. So my parents were American hippies and they had taken off in 1969 to try to get to Chile to see the new society after the socialist revolution in Chile for a lot of different reasons, complications. They did not make it that far, but they did buy 50 acres of land in northern Nicaragua, right on the border with Honduras, and they started a farm there. So I grew up between Nicaragua, and every time we had a war, <clears throat> we would go to Costa Rica, which happened twice while we were there. So the Sandinista Revolution and then the Contra War. And then when the Contra War started, we came to the U.S., and I came permanently for the first time. We lived all over the U.S., California, Texas, Iowa, Nebraska, New Hampshire, New York, what have you. Went to high school in upstate New York. Uh, my brother went to Tufts in front of me, and so I sort of followed him to Tufts after taking a year off in Costa Rica to be a butterfly garden tour guide, an elementary school teacher, a waiter, and a semi-pro soccer player. Went to Tufts, really wanted to focus on juvenile social work, and that's mm. what I thought I'd do. I worked in a juvenile prison during college and realized that it was pretty frustrating uh, being a day-to-day -day social worker in that space, very high recidivism rates. And so I said, okay, what I'm going to do instead as I finished up at Tufts was I'm going to do juvenile justice social policy work. So I applied to law schools and I applied to social policy schools. Unfortunately, I missed the deadline at the Kennedy School at Harvard to be in the social policy program. 
But when I got the letter from Harvard Law telling me that I had been accepted, everyone around me, my family, my, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, et cetera, said, you don't say no to Harvard Law School. So I went to Harvard and started interviewing, thinking about different things I could do, and then realized how much student loans I had. So I went after law school, I went to work at a big firm. I've always maintained a very robust pro bono book. So I've always done a lot of work for folks who, on the side who could not afford legal services. And that's been sort of my give back on the social policy side. But otherwise, you know, you laid out my background. I spent 10 years at a couple different law firms, including Skadden, as you mentioned. And then I came to a decision point. So my last firm offered me partnership. And at about the same time, an insurance brokerage firm approached me and offered me a job. And I lined them up next to each other. And quite honestly, in terms of what was most attractive at that moment in time with young kids at home and everything else, an insurance brokerage job with a pension and a 401k, matching 401k and everything and health insurance seemed a little bit more attractive. So I made the hard decision to walk away from what everyone considered sort of the brass ring of becoming a law firm partner. And I came over to the insurance brokerage world 14 years ago. I started off working on policies and claims. So not in, a, in an innovation role, except that day to day, you were negotiating new changes to insurance policies and finding innovative ways to expand coverage. That translated about four or five years after I came to the insurance brokerage world into an opportunity where <clears throat> the company said to me, have you ever created a new insurance policy? And I stopped and said to myself, I don't think I've ever done that, but there's no reason I can't do that. And so I said, I think I can do that for sure. And so I was put into the chief innovation officer role and started sort of thinking about bigger picture, what sort of new insurance products we could create beyond just incremental innovations to address unmet needs for our clients. Yeah. So I think it's just phenomenal. Like, and what a bizarre coincidence that I think you and I was in um, Nicaragua and Costa Rica studying at the University of Costa Rica in um, 89 and 1990, doing my anthropology work there. And I don't remember what year you were there much. I would have been there 1992 to 93. There you go. So we just missed each other. Meanwhile, you were running from the conflict. I was actually hitchhiking, trying to get to the conflict trying to engage in la lucha with yeah. with the community there but what a what an interesting transition and i'm sure that that perspective right coming from living on the land right in rural central america who would have thunk right yep. that you'd wind up in in big corporate america it feels like so, like absolutely antithetical to one another yes so i did not grow up with a lot of lawyers or business people or what <laughs> You had a machete to cut things down, and then that's how we move obstacles out of the way. Machete yeah. first. The, but the other piece I would say is I've always said that the one way that you can rebel against hippie parents is you go work for the man. So that's here right. I Put on pinstripes and a tie. Nothing can, right. Some of us were like, you know, shaving our head and looking for punk movements, and you're like heading to Wall Street, going to go see Skadden Arps about a little job. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I will say I did go to Nicaragua once with my head shaved. It led to a very long interrogation and and strip search by the local immigration authorities. So I learned from that, probably not a great idea. Probably not a great idea. They thought you were they thought you were a gringo in the in the military sense. Yeah, I think they thought I was a mercenary of some sort. I was carrying two two guitar cases as well which contained like guitar. mariachi. <laughs> yeah, but I, they did contain guitars that my mom had asked me to take to the local music school in my hometown. But needless to say, those got torn apart and searched pretty extensively to make sure there was no arms inside of the guitars. Oh my God. <laughs> See, and I got detained in, my, in the airport coming back from hitchhiking through Central America during that time because you needed $20 to enter Costa Rica at the time as a tourist fee, and I didn't have it. And I, I remember the customs guard, you know, customs person asking me, you know, there's a $20 fee to get in. And she said, how much money do you have in it? I said, in my best Costa Rican slang, ni un cinco, not even a nickel. And it, which was like just harsh streetwise slang. And she goes, you can sit here now. Five hours later, there I was in the airport. And I went to the lady. I said, look, if you don't think I've been living here 
then why would I know this slang? Mm -hmm. And she was like, good point. Okay, you can go. (laughs) At one point carried both the Nicaraguan and US passport. And the only time I tried to use the Nicaraguan passport was because I got to the border going from Nicaragua to Costa Rica. And I saw the sign that said the entry fee for Nicaraguans was a dollar. The entry fee for Americans was $20 or all foreigners. Yeah. Was so I pulled out my Nicaraguan passport and tried to use it. And they promptly said, where is your visa? Because if you're Nicaraguan to go into Costa Rica, you have to pre, you know, apply for a visa and everything else. Whereas an American citizen, you could just cross the border. Oh. So I put away, pulled out my U.S. passport, my 20 bucks and crossed the border. Sometimes you just got to pay the piper. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you a different story about crossing the Panamanian border a different time. That's for a different podcast. <laughs> but back to, so, you know, that kind of social justice related cause. And also, I think that kind of thinking also makes you a very creative problem solver. When we often talk about on this show, how you know, constraint breeds innovation. And when you are really pushed to the corners of the canvas without lots of resources at your disposal, you become a very, intuitively, you become a very creative problem solver. Did you find that even in your work on the insurance side? Yeah, I think absolutely. So if you've had a broad-based background, living in a lot of different places, thinking about a lot of different social issues and what have you, it, it arms you to be creative and thoughtful, even in a narrow niche like insurance about what you can do from a creative standpoint. Absolutely. Yeah. So talk to us. So, you know, my community here, we're all... We all have an innovation mandate as part of our job description. We are all looking to change the way we think about things. Tell us a little bit about how you think about innovation. Maybe give us some examples of some of the innovations that you worked on. Sure, absolutely. I I think, first of all, at at a high level, it is a little different. So I get probably, I don't know, 10 requests a day to connect on LinkedIn from people who do alternative Uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, what have you, um, not really relevant to what I do. So mine is pretty niche in terms of product innovation and in the insurance space. I think it fits into this world a bit in terms of how we think and how we problem solve, but very different from creating a consumer product or creating, you know, a, a new technological structure internally at a company. So when you focus on product innovation, I think a couple big things come up. Number one, how do you decide to create a new product? Where does the idea come from? How do you identify the need? And in my position, we have a certain number of constituencies from which we get ideas and what have you. So a big one is our own folks. So our own colleagues and what have you, rank and file all the way up to executives. People will reach out to me and say, hey, I just ran into this issue in this particular, to my surprise, or I always knew this, that this particular kind of exposure was not covered by the existing insurance policies. Do you think we, sh- we could create something that would fill that niche? So certainly ideas come from our own colleagues. Ideas come from our clients as well. So our insureds, which are largely you know big companies, private equity firms, what have you, where they come to us and they say, we have been talking to your folks or we've been talking to another broker, we've been talking to our lawyers, And they've been saying we have this risk, but there's no way to insure it. Is that something that we can address? We also get ideas from insurers sometimes. So we have, you know, extensive relationships with different insurance companies that we do a lot of business with and what have you. And they will come to us because they know we're innovative and they will say, hey, we have this idea internally. Would you be interested in collaborating on it to try to come up with a solution? And then finally, a big constituency for us is what we call centers of influence. So these are attorneys, investment banks, accountants, what have you, who work with our clients and they come to us and they say, here's an issue that we've run into. Is there some way to insure it better or insure it at all? Mm. A couple different examples of of sort of the the life cycle of an insurance product innovation that I will lay out for you. Uh, I always think it's good to share a success story but also maybe one that wasn't so successful as well. Let's all be honest. We we learn from the mistakes, right? More than we do the the triumphs. Indeed. Though I always comment, we make more from the triumphs. So (laughs) important. (laughs) So about eight to 10 years ago, a piece of legislation was released called the Dodd-Frank Act. It was about a thousand pages long. And one of my colleagues came into my office and said, 
hey, we've just got this big piece of legislation that was released, very relevant to financial services companies. We need you to go through this and see if you see any opportunities for new insurance products related to the obligations and everything else that are being created by this legislation. And I said, sure, and pulled out uh, a bottle of red wine, sat down and started to read the thousand pages. Obviously, oh. Are you really but going to tell us it was just one bottle for a thousand pages? <laughs> it feels like it might require more than that. Perhaps more, and perhaps something stronger as well. I remember when the ACA came out, I had a client who actually read the entire, you know, the entire Obamacare bill. It was excruciating. Yep. So I read through it and most of it was already sort of anticipated or dealt with by existing directors and officers, liability insurance and what have you. But I noticed one particular area for community banks that was new and unique, which was if you had a community bank go into receivership by the FDIC could seek to pull back from directors and officers compensation, you know, bonus compensation that they had previously received based upon good performance of the bank. And I said, that is not something that is really covered by a DNO insurance policy. So maybe there is something we can do to protect those people. Because can you imagine having received a bonus two years ago that you use to invest in a house or buy a car and what have you. And two years later, the FDIC comes and says, hey, we want the money back. Okay. So we put together a policy that dealt not only with sort of the legal costs of defending yourself against the FDIC, but also would actually cover the amount that you had to return. Because the, the requirement for recovery by the FDIC was not based on any intentional misconduct or anything like that. It was basically just a straightforward standard that if you receive this money within two years and then you go into receivership, you can be forced to give it back. So we created the product. We released it. Did have to negotiate with a couple of insurers to convince them that it was a good risk and what have you, that they could charge appropriate premium for it. That's always part of our process. We do not offer the capital ourselves as a broker. We have to get an insurer involved. So one more constituency and one more step in the process. But we released the product and it was doing pretty well. So I think we sold a, maybe 12 to 15 of these products to different community banks. And then we got a call from Mr. Frank's office, Mr. Barney Frank of Dodd-Frank. Oh my gosh. Where, what was that reaction? Well, did you think one of your coworkers was pranking you? I wasn't quite sure what to do with it. I, yeah. I, I did. There was a call that came before that, probably about two weeks earlier from a reporter and we did an interview. They'd been vetted by my PR department and what have you. We did an interview. And then it was released, the article was released, and I think the title of it was something along the lines of insurance broker creates product for Wall Street fat cats. Well, there was some internal heartburn around that. Um, I can only imagine as a former PR person, that's the one that keeps you up at night for sure. Well, so we thought about, you know, was that negative publicity or what have you? And I said, you know what, to some extent, I'm glad the reporter gathered what the product is because that, you know, in a... It's a negative way of describing it, but that is exactly what it was. It was to protect the compensation of, of some very successful and wealthy people who are putting themselves at risk by serving on the boards of these companies. Right. But I have a feeling that's what put it on Barney Frank's radar and his folks' radar. And so when they came forward, I was surprised and a little suspicious, but they were able to prove pretty quickly who they were and, and why they were calling. And why they were calling was, as they put it, we have heard that you have released an insurance product that basically guts the impact of our legislation. And I said, well, I wouldn't put it that way. And I tried to explain it to them and, and why it made sense and what have you. And at the end of the phone call, they said, thank you very much. They followed up with an email saying, if you don't withdraw this product, we are going to introduce legislation to bar community banks from buying it. So we withdrew the product needless to say, rather than have that happen. But it did remind us that we needed to probably think a little bit more about a couple aspects of our decision-making process beyond just, will this be a successful insurance product? So we definitely doubled down on our consideration of legal and compliance issues, um, which had always been part of the process, reputational issues, which had been part of the process, but probably not thought of as much as it could be. And then you balance that against 
do you have clients who have the monetary appetite to pay for this insurance product? And I'll get a little bit more into that in my second example. Mm -hmm. But then what's the total potential monetary gain for your own company in terms of releasing this product, right? So we definitely focus more after that on potential legal compliance and, and reputational issues in particular. So let's just stop there for a heartbeat because I hear this conversation all the time happening on this show where people say, when do I really bring in the PR people? When do I bring in the lawyers? And how do I ensure that those two groups do not stymie the innovation that I'm working on and the story that I want to tell? So what what do you think about that in hindsight and looking at that experience? So what we did essentially was we beefed up our process our innovation process and really formalized it more to make sure that we had a broad-based group of people who were focused on approving innovation projects so don't put a ton of work into a project and then go to legal and compliance and pr and say hey do you think this is okay have those folks and high-ranking folks in those groups involved from day one so we had an innovation council and we made sure that as part of the initial pitching of a potential product idea, PR folks were involved, legal and compliance was involved, in addition to senior executives and what have you, to make sure that everybody was on board. So there was a fleshing out of all of those issues at the beginning of the process instead of halfway through or, God forbid, at the end of the process when you put in hundreds of hours. Right. Yeah. And Sidebar, what does it feel like to have the full weight of the federal legislature potentially coming down on the little itty bitty product that you just happened to create? I think my legal legal career had prepared me a little bit for that, Uh but it was not pleasant. And the conversations that had to happen afterwards with legal and compliance and everyone else internally were not terribly pleasant either. It was unfortunate. I still think it was a good product. I still disagree that it gutted the intent of the legislation. But, you know, sometimes you have to just give into the reality that you've gone as far as you're going to go. Yeah. This is the point where you switch from the bottle of wine to the tequila. And then you really begin to have these conversations inside. Thank you for sharing that. It's very brave. And I, I just, I think too often we don't think about who we can extend a hand to across the aisle into other silos as we're working on innovation to say, help me see around corners, which is inherently what insurance does, right? It helps us to see around corners that we didn't really know existed. And so, you know, teacher has to become the student in this case, right? We have colleagues who can actually be our own insurance policies internally. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So So there's clearly another opportunity on the horizon that, uh, that maybe you, you can help us think about too. So let's talk about example number two. It is another lesson learned situation. We'll get to the success story third. We'll save that for last. That's the easy stuff. (laughs) Yes. Example number two. So we had a lot of clients who were having issues with the law called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Essentially, it precludes you and prohibits you from what at the end of the day is bribery to foreign government officials in order to get business. Now, that's very straightforward. Obviously, you can't bribe foreign government officials. It is far more complicated than that. The law is way, way more broad than that. And when you're doing business in certain jurisdictions like Nicaragua or certain countries in Africa or what have you, I'll use my country since I grew up there, it is a bribery-based economy, quite honestly. And so if you are, if you have a local finder or a local agent or what have you, and they come to you and they say, we need $50,000 for this project, The U.S. government expects you to figure out where every single dime of that $50,000 is going. And if even a dime is going towards the foundation owned by some government official or what have you, you are prohibited from paying it. So it's more complicated than just bribing a government official. But so we had a lot of clients coming to us and saying, we have this exposure. We've had some issues and the insurance never covers it. What can we do? So we said, this is really exciting. Can we put something together? Because we have all this client interest in this. Surely, you know, this would be a successful product. So we put together a product that balanced the sort of potential concerns with protecting, you know, this sort of payment and what have you. Had all these um, provisions around making sure that it wasn't intentional, wasn't purposeful bribery, what have you. It was accidental, what have you. But at the end of the day, 
it would cover these companies for the costs of defending themselves against a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act investigation, along with any local authority investigations as well. Again, we found an insurer who was willing to put their capital behind that, and we launched the product. We went on a roadshow. We went to law firms around the country. We went to conferences around the country. We did a series of webinars and presentations. I probably did between all of those things and individual client calls, somewhere around a thousand conversations about this product. Wow. And we never sold a single one. In a thousand sales calls. Yes. And the reason was, despite everything we had done to try to make the pricing and the structure more attractive, at the end of the day, the companies who had already had this issue said, well, we've tightened up our compliance. This should never happen again. Mm. Not true. Way. You often see companies have two or three of these within 10 or 15 years. And those who hadn't had one, one of these investigations yet said, this is too expensive. I don't want to pay for it. So again, we had failed to really dive into one really important factor in deciding whether or not to go down a path of innovation, which was there may be appetite for this product, but is there monetary appetite for this product? Are people going to be willing to pay for it? We're looking at it in hindsight, number one. And number two, they were looking at it from a perspective of this would be nice to have, but take out the hindsight and take out the experience. And up front, they were not willing to pay for it. So again, never sold a single one, didn't get off the ground. And we spent a tremendous amount of time on that. Okay. So what should we have done differently in this scenario? So I think you got to go back to the initial innovation council conversation. And within that conversation has to be, do we have monetary appetite for this product from the ultimate consumer? And you need to stress test that. Go back to the folks who said, we wish we had this. Go to a group of folks who have never had the issue, but would potentially benefit from the product and dive into it with them. Say at what level of annual sort of monetary expenditure, would you be willing to purchase this product? And if there is a disconnect between that and what you can set the cost at for the product, there's no reason to move forward. We don't talk a lot about pricing on this show, but I'm thinking maybe it is something we need to delve a little bit more deeply into. How did you actually figure out the price? So the price was an extensive negotiation with the insurer. Again, right, we have this third party constituency who's putting their capital on the line. So I don't have the ability to say, no, it should be cheaper. I have to have a conversation with the underwriters and the senior executives at that insurance company and, and try to convince them that the product should be cheaper. The other thing that we did do, because we acknowledged that the initial price was significant, was we put together a whole alternative sort of pricing and buying structure with an, with an option element and what have you to try to address that. It, it's still never moved the needle, unfortunately. Yeah. So it's funny, like, you know, there's, what year was that when you were working on that? How long ago was that? Probably would have been 2007, around there. Right. And it's amazing, right? A thousand sales. Oh, I'm sorry. Calls. A thousand, two, sorry. 2017, a thousand sales calls. At what point do you think you might have in hindsight said, okay, I think we could stop at a hundred. Like something's not going right here. <laughs> well, it was a blitz, right? We went out there in the first six months and did that in probably six months. And it wasn't as if there was a moment when somebody said, this is a terrible idea. Nobody's ever going to buy this. Every call, every meeting we had was very positive. And they said, this is really interesting. This is really thoughtful. You really know what you're talking about at the insurance level, but even more so at the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act level. You know, I had done some FCPA investigations at my, my law firms back in the day. And so people were very receptive and very interested, but literally you would flip to the last slide, which contained the pricing structure and people would close their book. So that probably should have been an indication that something was wrong, but it was a quick blitz. Everybody was interested and then nobody wanted to buy it. Now I will say this, I do think that innovation in my space, and this is probably true in a lot of other spaces as well, making more revenue for your company is an important goal, but getting more visibility for your company 
is also perhaps not equally important, but very important as well. And that product and that roadshow gave us a tremendous amount of visibility to law firms, to investment banks, to clients, to people in the industry who said, all right, these folks are actually being really innovative. They're smart. They know what they're doing. And if we have some sort of other issue, whether it's kind of a plain vanilla you know, everyday issue or if it's a complicated issue, those are folks we should go to with it. So I do think it ultimately had benefits, just not short-term revenue benefits. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and there is never a problem with reaching out to customers. I also wonder, you know, as a brand person, I wonder if this, you know, A, elevates you in the eyes of clients for coming up with a really innovative solution. And they know that you're capable of that now and that you're able to handle high-end products as well. Like it's a, sometimes it can be a repositioning as opposed to the block and tackle, right? That there's something on the, for lack of a better term, on the luxury end of the spectrum that you're able to manage that capability too. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's talk about the positive story. Yes, please. <laughs> so, and I'm going to try my best to avoid insurance concepts and acronyms and what have you in this description, because it's really niche. Mm. Between 2019 and 2021, you had over a thousand special purpose acquisition companies launched in, in the US and around the world. And what these are is they are shell companies, blank check companies, where a group of individuals raises money through an IPO based upon their background and experience and a very thin description of what their plan is. And the ultimate plan is to take this uh, shell public company and ultimately do a reverse merger with a private company to take them public. So these special purpose acquisition companies SPACs. would IPO. Okay. Yep, SPACs. They would IPO and then they would go through their process. And if everything worked out with the SEC and they found a deal and what have you, it was very beneficial for everyone involved. Before 2019, however, this was something where you would see maybe 25 or 50 of these a year, and suddenly you saw 500 in a year, another 800 in a year. So there was definitely a glut in the marketplace. And what that did was it disrupted everything, including the insurance. So the cost of insurance for a SPAC, which basically just buys director and officer liability insurance, but the cost of insurance for a SPAC went through the roof. So in the fall of 2020, the premiums went up five to 10 times and the deductibles on these policies went up five to 10 times as well. Wow. So that created a situation in the spring of 2021 where you had SPACs who are fairly thinly funded saying, we, we can't afford directors and officers liability insurance in this situation. What are we supposed to do? Because our directors don't wanna serve unless they are protected. So I took a look at how typical DNO insurance is structured and how the SPAC life cycle works. And I said, I think we're doing this wrong. This SPAC policy, this DNO policy is written for existing public companies who have a business and, you know, sort of are, are going about doing their actual operations and what have you. It is not structured for a SPAC. So I had an idea about how to restructure it that would reduce upfront premium costs by 40 to 60% and move those costs later on in the process when there was more money to pay for insurance premium. I went out to five or six insurers. I pitched the idea. Mo said, I'm perfectly comfortable collecting the big premiums I'm currently protecting, no, you know, currently collecting, no thank you. One insurer said, we're interested. Let's talk about how this would work. So we went from introduction of the initial idea to putting together the entire insurance policy and launching this program on a proprietary basis in about two weeks. Wow. And day one that I had the authorization to talk to SPACs about this product, we talked to 12 SPACs and all 12 of them said, that's what we want to do. Mm. We buy our insurance in that structure. Over the course of the following nine months, I believe we sold about 85 of those policies, $30 million in premium or so to the insurer, 
and about five or six million dollars in revenue to us. So it was very successful and it upset, sort of disrupted the entire SPAC DNO insurance marketplace and structure in a very beneficial way for our clients. And needless to say, it caused a lot of not yet clients to call us and say, how do we do that? We heard you're doing it for this SPAC. We want to do it as well. So it was very productive from a revenue perspective, a visibility perspective, even SPACs who chose not to buy that particular structure, they would come to us and appreciate that we were trying to do something different and they would buy it in the traditional method, but through us. I'm intrigued by so many layers of this story. Can we just talk about speed for a moment? Sure. How important is, I mean, SPACs are, I want to say relatively new, or I would say relatively more in vogue. You're looking at, you know, startups are trying to find ways to avoid bankers fees, right? They're looking for new and innovative ways to get communities that they've spent so much money building to kind of get involved in the process and really begin to lift up the opportunity. How fast, given your own competitive landscape, how important was speed in that process? Speed was tremendously important. So uh-huh. I, I said that the market changed in the fall of 2020. We were you know, banging our heads against the wall for three or four months, trying to find ways to chisel down the premium a bit and what have you uh-huh. with inc- sort of innovation. And I said, we need to fundamentally disrupt how this is being done and we need to find a partner to do that. Now, again, this is a situation where your background and previous experience is tremendously important to being able to come up with a new idea. So SPACs have been around for a long time, but you are absolutely correct. They came in vogue, much more in vogue, you know, 2018, 2019 through 2022. For sure. So during my time in the on the legal side, I had worked with a SPAC and their target company who had gotten sued for alleged securities fraud after they bound their DSPAC. So I knew my way around the transaction. I knew my way around the litigation that can ensue from that transaction. I knew the life cycle of SPACs and I had learned the sort of how other folks were doing the insurance for them, right? On, On this side of the house. So I had all the knowledge that I needed to say, all right, here's a better solution. Right. Here's the problem with how we're doing it now. And here's the better solution. So there was very little need to educate myself on how things work or what have you. I had that. Right. So that probably saves me three to six months. The other part was having a flexible partner. If you have to collaborate with a third party in order to get an innovation out there, it is tremendously important that they also know what they're talking about, be familiar with the area and and be creative and innovative. And I did find a partner who was willing to do that. And I do think they were able to move as quickly as they did because you have a long history of sort of shared experience and trust between the two of you. I mean, you had to agree that this wasn't just going to get the insurance company burned with a million claims as well, right? So that back scary stuff. That's scary. Yep. So that background experience and trust was very important um, in putting that relationship together and getting that product out there. <clears throat> and then we haven't gotten to it. But then the question is, how do you launch it? If you put it together in two weeks and you're ready to go, you don't want to then spend another four weeks or six weeks or whatever it takes to put together formal marketing materials and, and launch that product, right? You have lost your advantage at that point. So I was asked, how do, you, how do we think we're going to market this? And I said, it starts with basically just guerrilla marketing. I am going to put a post on LinkedIn that announces the product to my network. And then we're going to have every single producer who is interested within our company, take that post, share it, repost it, like it. You know, and we will we'll, we will prepare also, you know, a backup email that provides more detail and what have you about how it works. And we are just going to go out there and push this out there. So no, no white papers, no formal marketing pieces, no press release. Fascinating. So as I told you, Susan, we launched it on LinkedIn with a limerick about what was wrong with the SPAC insurance marketplace. And and then we explained what we were going to do to fix it. Okay. You have to read the limerick for us, please. 
Oh, let me go find the limerick. Hang on for a second. <laughs> and if you can't find it, then I will. Because it's... it is, I, I will say, it is an innovation storyteller show first that someone, and, and I'm going to put it out as an innovation challenge to the rest of, to the rest of us. See if you can write a limerick around your new innovation, your new breakthrough product or service. And if so, I will be happy to feature it on the show and on the website. Go ahead, Match, share it with us. All right. I'm flipping to it. Unfortunately, I took about a thousand pictures recently because I'm getting ready to submit my expenses, the, the dark side of innovation, but hang on for just a second. Yeah, and I have it open here if you can't find it. Here it is. So the limerick was, and I had to make up a town to rhyme with, but here's the limerick. There once was a SPAC from St. Prurence, whose plan was of great reassurance. Their S1 was a dream. They're one hell of a team, but they still paid a ton for insurance. Woohoo! Yes. I'm sure there are like small towns in Ireland that are now like reciting this limerick on the regular over a nice pint of Guinness. And talking about how we can have SPAC insurance now in a way that we never had before. And and the other thing was that ha half of the responses on LinkedIn were probably questioning my skills as a poet, but it still <laughs> spread the word, right? So right. the more it gets, the better. Well, you know, and shout out and kudos to you for really taking a walk on the creative limb and, you know, really stepping out there and trying something different. Uh, how many of us think about running every single thing that we do, you know, to ex exhibit A, your first point, right? About like, do we get the PR people involved here? And how many times do we say, time is of the essence? Like we have a window where we, really, we can really make a mark. How can we do it? Yep. And so I, much, I just think it's great taking a leap like that. And God knows LinkedIn needs a little bit of levity every once in a while too. That is some serious stuff happening most days of the week there. Yes, indeed. So, so let's, as we conclude our conversation today, when you think about the other innovators who are on this show, you have a very specific lens that you look at business and innovation through. What's some advice that you would give, you know, chief innovation officers, Fortune 500 companies who, who listen to the show, our guests on the show, what would you want them to know? So I think the most important thing to know is that you're asking, typically in our job, you are asking someone to do something that's scary. You have to understand the psychological request that you are making. Mm. So you are asking someone to do something different. You're asking them to perhaps dedicate some resources towards something different. And so you have to overcome, first of all, the sense of inertia and that inertia feels safe. That, hey, you know what? We're doing pretty well right now. Why would we take a risk and do this? And granted, you're going to have to explain to them why it's not as risky as they might feel. But at a very basic level, you're asking someone to do something different. And I don't think most human beings quickly embrace the idea of doing something different, right? So the first thing will be that everyone will come at you with all the why nots, you know, why we shouldn't do this, why, what, what could go wrong, how much it might cost, what have you. So you really have to be thoughtful as, a, as an innovator about anticipating those concerns and being ready to address them. So this being a, a storyteller um, space, I think it's very important to be ready to tell your story internally and externally and do not go out there with your great new product without having really prepared yourself, both personally and sort of in terms of the product, to tell the story, to tell the background of why you're doing what you're doing, to tell the go forward sort of story about how this could be really successful and why it will be successful. I think all of that is tremendously important. And if you, when I say personally, if you don't have the skill set to tell the story, you need to develop that skill set. You need to be able to craft a story, craft a narrative. And you really need those skills to be able to do it because you can sit in a dark room with or without a bottle of red wine and come up with a lot of great ideas. But if you can't tell the story of why it's a great idea to somebody else, it's not going to go anywhere. I think you are just reading the copy off my website. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, the way that we actually get breakthrough ideas 
to number one, be memorable, and number two, have momentum inside of our organizations is the story that we attach to it. Because just kind of throwing down a thousand page document, certainly, or even a policy, none of us have that necessarily the lens that you could give us to read it and understand it. Okay, before we conclude, I ask every guest on the show the same three questions. So let me ask you, what is the most important innovation of all time? Electricity. Mm. Couldn't run that internet without the electricity now, could we? No, but uh, it may have led us down some dark paths as well. But I would say electricity is probably one of the most important. Here. If you had the opportunity to join any innovation team in history, which team would you have joined? Wow. We did, we did not prepare for these hard-hitting questions. We did the... not. We did not. That's why it's called the hot seat, relatively lukewarm seat, but okay. I think I would like to go back to the innovation team that was putting together the first electric vehicle and talk about the consequences of how we were going to put that together would play out in, in terms of, is it even a green product? Can we make it as a green product? Can we find a way where it doesn't have its own tremendous impact upon the environment and sort of the socioeconomic landscape of the entire world? Is there a way to to do this better? You know, such a fascinating concept, right? Our first vision of the electric car, 1830. 1830, right, is how far back we go. So if we could rethink it from jump, we might yep. be in a very different position right now. Good point. Okay. And then finally, what is an innovation that you really wish humanity would have or a situation that really pisses you off that could be solved with something new, with a new innovation? So I have two boys, 16 and 20 years old, and I have to think there is something that we can do from an innovation perspective, but from a political and economic and what have you perspective to reduce the negative impact of smartphones and social media. We are just trending in a direction where we are going to have a generation of people with tremendously short attention spans, the, an over-focus on absorbing content as opposed to creating content, and just an expectation that it's totally normal to spend five, six, seven hours a day scrolling through your phone. I have to think there's something that we can do to improve that. And look, it's a tremendously valuable piece of technology from an educational perspective and everything else. But how do we maximize that instead of what we're doing right now, which is I think is viciously minimizing that for most people and making it a really dangerous weapon as opposed to a valuable technology. Right. And I mean, how many times have you been to a restaurant where you've seen toddlers on iPads, right? I mean, we're our teenagers might be in a better position than even what we're starting very young folks with. And it's amazing to me how many times I go to Silicon Valley and I talk to executives and I say, oh, I don't let my kids do that. You know, the progenitors of this technology don't even let their kids near it. Yeah, I mean, look, I grew up even more off the grid than most people from our generation. So. Right. We had no television in our house. I think it, to the extent I had media, it was mostly national public radio. Read a lot of books, played a lot of board games. And that evolved into having a mind that could do some things that I'm really, I really don't think that if I had grown up watching television three hours a night or much less spending as much time on my phone and social media as happens these days that you would necessarily have the creativity and the ability to do some things. So it's very concerning to me. And I just want to circle back for one second to the concept of overcoming inertia. The big thing about the, the storytelling, I think, is that the way you overcome inertia is, be, is by creating excitement. You can't just convince somebody that you're correct. You have to get them excited about your idea so that they want to be part of it and support it. So it, there's a fairly big leap from inertia to excitement. And the story is what fills the gap in between. Could not have said it better myself. Could not have said it better. And by the way, that's because we're releasing all of these incredible, you know, chemi brain chemicals. Adrenaline gets people moving, right? And sometimes that's fear. Sometimes that's excitement. 
And then we settle people back down with a little neuroepinephrine and some serotonin, right? The way that we convey the story actually allows people to step into a future without the terror that comes with overcoming that inertia. Much, thank you so much for being on the show today. If someone wants to contact you and learn truly the ins and outs of a SPAC and how to protect themselves, not to mention all the other things we talked about, what's the best way to connect with you? Sure. So if you put in my first name on LinkedIn, M-A-C-H-U-A, I will be the first and probably only one to pop up. My parents gave me a very odd name. We can get into that whole story another time. Yeah, the other wine or tequila, either one of those. Yeah. <laughs> the other way, feel free to email me. It's mach, M-A-C-H dot millet, M-I-L-E-T at Lockton, L-O-C-K-T-O-N dot com. Awesome. Mach, thank you so much for joining me. And I'm sure we'll see you again on the Innovation Storyteller Show. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the invite.